councillors, members of the public, let me take you back to October in 1982. Wolverhampton Polytechnic. I just trudged an hour to get to the first lecture of the day, wearing blue suede, well, blue faux suede winkle pickers and a Harrington jacket, <laughs> which at the time were very fashionable, but were not, sadly, weatherproof. And it was one of those grey, wet West Midlands days that sees the cold seep into your very bones. Dr Morgan spoke to me then, it's the first time I heard it, 1982, about global warming, about how carbon dioxide increasing in the uh, atmosphere would bring about a four degree temperature increase. A callow youth, cold to the bone, looking out of the window, I said to him, Dr Morgan, would that be such a bad thing? And he put me straight. He said, it doesn't mean we'll have um, Marbella in the West Midlands here. What it means is more energy in the um, environment. What it means is actually heavier rain when it rains. Bigger storms when there are storms. And droughts. And don't forget the effect, he said, of the Sahara moving up into Europe and halfway across Spain. Now look, as a young socialist about to be given the opportunity to vote Labour for the very first time, and a believer in international socialism, his words struck home. And that's where I began taking green issues seriously. But it's 40 years ago. My generation, frankly, has ignored the truth. In our greed for personal gratification, we've used fossil fuels, we've chased convenience, We've looked for a disposable economy, disposable bags, disposable knives, disposable forks, disposable plates, cups, tents, razors, everything in order to make our lives easy. But in our consumer frenzy of throwing things away, we're in danger of ignoring that the earth is a one-off. It isn't disposable, disposable and needs care if it is to last for our children. Dr Morgan's warnings were not heated, heated. Ice caps are melting. Storms are more violent. 98% of scientists today say that global warming is a fact and it's happening now. And I think that the 2% that disagree are largely in the employ of the petrochemical industry. I've tried to do my bit. I've planted a tree everywhere I've lived. I compost. I don't indulge in disposable fashion. I wear a jumper rather than turn up the heating. I recently started car sharing on the way to work. I walk into the civic truck uh, centre more often than I use the car. I recycle, I reuse and I reduce. But it says the Labour leader of this Labour administration here that we can make the most difference. Recently I was asked a question, will Harlow de Labour declare a climate emergency? Now look, I get asked some pretty tough questions as a leader of this council, but this wasn't one of them. Will Harlow Labour declare a climate emergency? Of course we will. Of course we will. But that's not enough. We need to be taking some action too. At the uh, climate emergency um, rally last Saturday, I pledged that this council would remove single-use plastics from our buildings. That we would push to reduce our carbon footprint as an organisation and achieve carbon neutrality faster than the target that we would encourage HTS to electrify their fleet, that we would look to put electric charging points throughout the town, that we would fit water fountains in our shopping centres so that people didn't need to buy expensive water in plastic bottles, that we'd reduce road mark miles through looking at how we could use local tendering for council services, that we would build new homes to the highest possible environmental standards and that we would plant, this year, at least a thousand trees. And that I would personally use my influence with neighbouring districts to ask them to do the same. And use the influence of Harlow Trading Services, HTS, to encourage other businesses to do the same. To ask, to tell them, this is what we're doing, why aren't you? There is a climate change emergency. It's happening now. We need national and international action to truly make an impact. But I want Harlow Labour to drive forward what we can do in this town.
Very good. Outrageous. suede shoes myself and like you I was an environmental trailblazer because my mother um, suited me out in Terry Towley uh, <laughs> which I'm told are more environmentally friendly than the disposable kind so I was there as well <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to make clear that the uh, Conservative group fully supports the, the principles and the tents out in the main motion um, but we move these amendments because we feel, as I know does the administration, feel that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that faces us um, and, and our, our modern way of life. Um, and we do feel, um, and I, yeah, I'd like to, um, <coughs> I'd like to recognise the fact that the council is taking a lead on this because we recognise this group that climate change and the burden of it should fall on those with the broadest shoulders and not primarily on the poor. And everything that either we put forward or yourself have put forward takes account of the fact that it's going to be the council that's taking the lead on this. Uh, and I think that's a very important thing to say at this point. Um, we move some of the amendments in here because we feel that climate change by greenhouse gas emissions does pose a direct threat to our way of life but there are wider implications of human activity upon the environment which then come back and impact upon our, our future and our civilization and that's why we move those. There, as Councillor Ingle has said, there are many um, skeptics, detractors, conspiracy theorists sort of surrounding this. Um, I had the great privilege of meeting a, a gentleman called Dr. Rob Malverney over here who works for the Ice Dynamics and Paleo Climate Team for the British Antarctic Survey a number of years ago. I actually had the privilege of holding a piece of ice for our ice sample that was 20,000 years old in my hands. Quite amazing. But that aside, um, after speaking with him, he left me in no doubt that the work that most scientists are doing all points towards climate change. And the cause of that is fundamentally human activity and the emission of greenhouse gases. Now, he did turn around and say at that point, you know, if I've got it all wrong, but we follow my advice, the best thing we can have is, well, sorry, I've got it wrong, but we've got cleaner air. But if we have got it wrong, we don't listen to him, and he was right, then to do nothing would be completely reckless. In one of our uh, amendments, the one where we look at developing a wider strategy, uh, looking at the impact upon the environment, we mention that because um, there are many things that we do, and, and I think the council and I'm glad that Councillor Ingle um, met with him tonight and actually um, I thank him personally and publicly for, for me to me to, to discuss these amendments and offer his support for them. But I was actually shocked to learn uh, when I watched a documentary last year that to make a pair of jeans takes 15,000 litres of water. And um, the aerial sea in Kazakhstan um, has lost an area the size of Ireland over the past 40 years because water is being diverted <coughs> to, um, to feed the cotton fields that uh, are needed to satisfy that consumer urge that you're talking about. Many people will say, well, China, America, they're pumping billions more uh, tons into the atmosphere than we can ever hope to stop. So what's the point? even if we do accept that this is indeed the right thing to do. And I was reminded by Councillor Johnson of a, a quote from Mother Teresa. That's Mother Teresa, God rest her soul. God, not Mother Teresa in Downing Street, God rest her soul. That's on Twitter now. And the quote, the quote she, she said was, be faithful in small things because it's in them that strength lies. And what we're doing today on a global scale may be a small thing indeed, but I'm sure when we do it, there is great strength within.
Was it separate members? Yeah. yeah, Secretary Chair, I, I just wanted to um, say that uh, sometimes these things can be, uh, you know, these discussions can be a bit uh, moralistic and vague. Because as a local authority, we have actually responsibility for many of the issues that we need to face up to. And uh, one of those is waste. For years we've been looking at the percentage of recycling as, as a key indicator of how well we're doing. Because now we all understand that recycling things uh, is not necessarily the answer. Um, I heard on the, on the radio yesterday that over 50% of uh, fashion wear is thrown away within a year. And it, it goes back to the point that Councillor yes. Perry was making. These products are being made elsewhere in the world uh, at the expense of the people of that part of the world. So we've got to move from regarding recycling as our target much further backwards now. We, we've in fact got to start off with reducing what we make, what we consume. Because let's face it, we've all grown up the first half of the last century, there was so much deprivation that everybody was glad to get to the point in the second half where we could have as much as we could afford of anything we wanted. And um, then we had the throwaway society considered a positive thing. You know, you bought things and you, and you threw them away. So we've got to start out with reduce. Reduce the amount we make and reduce the amount we consume. We've then got to reuse things that, you know, normally we would have thrown away. We've, we've got to reuse, you know, the, the water bottles and things like that. And we are looking at, uh, uh, already discussing the question of whether we can install water fountains in different parts of the town so people can fill their reusable bottles up uh, easily. And then we've got to see the next step as upcycling where things that perhaps we might not need can actually be used by someone else with a bit of improvement and we're fortunate in this town to have voluntary sector organisations that actually can do that. And then we get to recycling and again we've, we've got to regard it almost now as a failure if we get to recycling and certainly beyond that dumping our waste because it's totally futile to make things which we then put in a hole in the ground. So yes, we can, if we start looking at these things in a radical way, we can actually start changing the way we behave in Harlow and obviously nationally and internationally. The last point I want to make is sometimes people say, what's the point in us doing it in this country when other countries are still burning more coal, still um, you know, the, uh, having more cars and so on. Well, <coughs> I went to Shropshire on a break uh, just before Easter, and I went to Ironbridge in the area around there, and I saw where it all started, where the industrial production first started making oil. And of course, we know from the history that we actually kicked all this off. We are the, the initiators of pollu world pollution. So, yes, it may be a small contribution that we can make, but in a way, we <coughs> deserve to make it because we started the whole messy process off in the first place. Uh, I look at the amount of single-use plastics that we're using, I look at the throwaway society that we've gained, I look at microplastics entering the food chain, plastic clogging the ocean, waste being burned and buried for thousands of years. And I know that's not good for the planet. Um, I studied archaeological science. So the problem I have with climate science is 
And I'm not, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced, I think, is the, is the issue. Okay. It, it, these things, I know you've been trying. These things like the AMO, the, the Atlantic um, um, multi decadal um, oscillations, which can't be explained as part of the hockey stick. Sorry, I studied um, dendrochronology and dendroclimatology um, at the and um, <laughs> no, one would, no, no climate scientist has yet been able to explain to me the um, medieval warm period properly, other than well, it was an anomaly, a 200 year anomaly where Tuscan grapes were able to grow in Yorkshire. Now, I know Yorkshiremen will tell you it's God's own country, but Tuscan grapes don't normally grow there. Um, however, I thoroughly buy into what Councillor Perry said about these things are worthwhile doing because if if, if I'm wrong, and it is right, then yeah, uh, we're in we're in danger zone. Uh, that's what all the scientists tell me, and there's much better scientists out there than I. So I have to follow their lead. Councillor Inglegrace 82 and Councillor Perry mentioned. I'll have to mention it as well. So as a six-year-old, I was bringing home crisp packets and uh, plastic bags and stuff from the playground because my dad taught me that you shouldn't just throw your rubbish everywhere. And that developed a love of recycling. And I, I totally get where Councillor Person's coming from now about recycling should be the very end point. We should be doing things well before that. And where I live and represent in Church Langley, there's a thriving set of Facebook pages where there's always stuff being offered. I'm getting rid of this. Does anyone, can anyone make use of it? I'm moving out tomorrow and I've got this left over. Can someone take it? And there's, there's kind of almost a, you know, a, a train of passing stuff around rather than taking it down the dump and getting rid of it, which is rightly so. Um, but I think, it, it, at worst case for me, a lot of these things are small C conservative. I don't want to bring the politics in, but small C conservative. Um, you know, they're good things to do. But a lot of the time they make clear financial sense. So in that way, very happy to support. And for those members in the chamber, and perhaps for the members of the public, this is nothing new for this council. Um, I think this council has actually led the way, and perhaps we should have shouted a lot more across the different administrations about the things that we've done already. Um, just outside, there's a cabinet where in 20, 2007, I think it was, Councillor Durkin and then Councillor Millington, who's no longer here in the chamber, um, of the, um, what's the party? Um, Liberal Democrats, um, <laughs> signed up to the Nottingham Declaration um, to reduce this council, to reduce public sector carbon emissions by 25% by 2010, a target that this council hit under their leadership. And then um, Councillor Hall, from our side, led on the same thing. And I've got some figures for you. Between 2009-10 and 2011-12, that's the, three, the last three year period of the Conservative administration here, we committed to reducing CO2 by a further 25%. And we reduced natural gas by 25.9% CO2. We reduced CO2 from electricity by 27.8%. And we reduced CO2 total emissions by over 33% in that three year period. A total reduction of 954 tonnes per car. I have to say it's dropped off a little since then, and in the three years between 14-15 and 16-17, the council's total carbon emission reductions have been only 21 tons. So there is now a lot of work to do, and there's a lot more catching on to do. And that's why I'm fully supported backing the motion tonight, backing the amended motion, because I think it is the right thing to do. But I would just say, the quote that Councillor Perry used about not putting the cost of environmental changes on the backs of the poor is really important. In France, the yellow vest protests were sparked by the seven cent environmental tax on diesel. And there's a real famous quote that's going around that came out from those yellow vest protests. The elites are talking about the end of the world, while we're talking about making it to the end of the month. Environmental change is important, but mustn't be done on the backs of the poor people. Uh, thank you very much. I promise I won't mention anything about my charter. <laughs> uh, I just want to make five uh, particular points. As the cabinet member that's responsible for the economic opportunities within the town, it's incumbent on us that we actually do something. And I think the big problem we've got in Harway, like in many other places, is that the average person does their little bit, but they don't know what else they can actually do. So I do know under my portfolio we are actively engaged with all businesses, large and small, to look at what they do and the impact that produces. 
uh, I give you just two examples. Our largest outlet is private. <coughs> and my colleague to the left uh, made a very powerful statement that actually the churn of clothes that are used and then thrown away is absolutely, completely astonishing. And where those clothes are made and how those clothes are made is equally uh, astonishing. And somehow we've got to have that grown-up debate with young people and others about real choice and real opportunity. And then the other side of the economy is the takeaway business. Uh, recently, I had the pleasure of going to Clifton Hatch uh, to have a very good kebab. Uh, and actually, it came in a box that is not recyclable wrapped in a paper that became greasy so it's not recyclable. It was actually then put in a carrier bag that was tied in a knot so you couldn't undo it and reuse it and they gave me a plastic fork. And again what we have to start doing is looking at ways of supporting small businesses to make those changes to improve everybody's lives. The third example I give is the massive love of coffee outlets. If you look how many coffee beans are grinded every day in Harlow and then very little is done with them, it is truly shocking. Equally, we can talk about the cups, the plastics, and again, the spoons. But again, we've got to provide real opportunity for these people through customer pressure to make these changes and these differences. I would also like to add the area about our new Harlow Science Park and our new Nexus house is due to be completed at the end of August and then you will take it over. And you will be amazed how much innovation and best endeavour has actually gone into that to make it as green, as friendly as we possibly um, can. Small changes can make a big difference. And we need to work with the schools and I commend the schools and the colleges for the activities that they are doing. And my final point, and the leader is absolutely manic about these trees, and we welcome that. I've got a fixation about wildflowers, and I'd just like to compliment uh, about five years ago myself and Shona Johnson uh, and the wonderful former councillor Guy Mitchinson had a great debate about the need to bring nature back into Harlow. And I'm absolutely delighted that one of the opportunities that we can bring back to the town is a plethora of wildflowers because that will help the economy, it will help the environment, it will make people feel good about the environment and feel that they are secure in that environment. And I have to also say in my portfolio it will also help tourism as well because where we have got a welcoming opportunity through trees, wildflowers, it makes people feel better about the community. So this is an important issue, but we still need to make sure that we all make those small changes, because those small changes make the difference. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep this quite brief, because I think everyone's touched on it, but I just want to make one observation, and that was the first three people to talk are all teachers. And that actually gives me great hope for the future, because if these are the three kind of men that are teaching our kids about climate change and about this emergency. That's really, really good. So I'd like to congratulate Councillor Ingle and Councillor Vince for bringing this motion. But annoyingly, for the second time, Councillor Perrin has brought an amendment which this side has to accept. He did it in the budget and he does it here. Um, but I hope it goes to show that actually this chamber can work and we can work in collaboration and we can actually make a real difference. So on record for thanking the two to the left and right of me and to the person over on the opposite side of the chamber, I think this is a really good motion and I welcome his amendments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll mention my childhood. In terms of education, it was very poor. So I was a mature student, a mature student and caught up later on but didn't actually do science. So um, thank you for all this knowledge. But where I come in is actually air pollution is what concerns me. Now, I attended a conference in London with Client Earth and also the Air Pollution School Children's Network. 
and schools that in London are actually really concerned about the problem. Now, I know we're not in London, but actually parents are making choices about schools based on the air pollution locally. Now, it is relevant, so, so please bear with me, um, because I personally had to medically retire. You know, respiratory problems are, have been a major for me, and thank goodness to Adam Brooks and the Chair's uh, charity, a different department, but thank you for that. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today. So where I'm concerned is that actually, when I look at the air quality on Essex County Council, where I'm paying you know, the, my 85p of council tax, I note that they monitor every town in Harlow, every town in Essex, sorry, has a monitor, but the nearest one to Harlow is near Stansted. Now, um, I don't quite understand that, and bearing in mind the, the development that's going on, the exciting garden town arrangements, I do think I need to just plant the seed about that, because in, in Essex County Council, someone must be asking, why isn't there a monitor in Harlow? If you go on the website, there isn't. And then just one final thing, in terms of the end of Carnival Show and the reason um, that I went to, I've really got to praise a local charity, Raised Roof, because if we're looking at recycling, the recent production of uh, Desmond who survived in a world of climate change, if you looked at the costumes, it was just fantastic. All these different coloured crisp bags that they've made into costumes. And they've been reused a couple of times because it was so good they've been asked to reappear. So we need to take, um, uh, you know, really learn from all around us, really. We can all do something, but I think they're a magnificent example, and I just want to mention it. Thank you. I go back to 1971 <laughs> um, when I did A-level physics and physics because I thought I could get it in sociology because it was interesting and then did an environmental science degree at Salford University. Um, what was interesting about the science, the environmental science degree was on the one hand you were looking at public policy and on the other hand you were also looking at things like you know, campaigning law and various other things. So as well as learning about the science of dustbins and the life cycle of the liver flutes and why flies prefer a calf dung to cow dung to lay their eggs in tracks like that. We also had a 10 week course which actually looked at the whole sort of implications of the resources and what mankind was doing to resource it. And, uh, and what was interesting about that in particular was, whilst on the one hand we recognised that they were looking at things like peak oil. I don't know what it was going to be in 1990, so come on a bit before that. But equally at that time, the more mainstream was saying, oh yes, we'll oil mark people, but we're okay because we've got the oil shale over in Canada and America. So, and it was a small minority, there was a guy there called John Goodyear, who was a bit of an outlier at that time, in terms of saying, hang on here, yes, you can use those oil shale, but because of carbon, and the implications of the burning of carbon, the implications for that, for climate warming and what have you. And to a certain extent, this is in the early 70s, John was poo poo which is sort of seen as a little bit of an eccentric over there. And what I find fascinating over the last whatever many years, that is 40 odd years now, is the way the balance has shifted, the way that we've gone from the, the, rec the recognition that not only does weird mankind have a resource issue about how we use resources and how with an increasing population and the pressures etc. But also there's more and more of a recognition on the effects that we had on the on our environment and on and, and the you know, picking up on the on the point that Andrew was making, you know, the real effects that uh, mankind has on its environment. So I find on the one hand, it's almost tragic really, that it's taken that length of time. Yes, scientists have, uh, scientists were talking about this 20 years ago, you know, you had, uh, um, you had racial 
Carson years ago talking about the effect of fertilizers and what have you on bird life, etc. Uh, we then had um, Bellamy and various others warning us about the effects of uh, climate warming and climate change. So, yes, that was being that was being talked about, but slowly but surely it's become more and more and more mainstream, so it's now accepted. So on the one hand, I find it tragic that it's almost taken that long. On the other hand, I find it just amazing to think that here we are at long last, we in Harlow, along with a whole lot of other councils and a whole lot of you know, other governments, it's now part of a global movement to say, look, we have to recognise this and we have to deal with it. And what's more, we can start by, you know, and again, picking up on the point that I think Andrew made, if we're wrong, if we do these things and there isn't a need to do it, then that's, you know, well, we haven't lost anything. The evidence is that we do need to do it. And if we do it and it works, then we've done a marvellous thing. We would have saved the planet. Thank you, Chair. If nothing else has come from this debate, and appreciate the, the administration accepting the amendments, then it's the rare compliment I've received from Councillor Mullins. It's immensely worthwhile. So thank you for that. Um, this issue, as we've I'm glad to see it go beyond colour, race, creed, or political affiliation. It's bigger than all of us. Uh, and it's, uh, it's at times like these, it's lovely to see a rare, rare glimpse of unity between us all. And I, I'm really, really proud of that. Uh, I particularly agreed with um, some of the points of Councillor Purton made. Um, and he's right, we started off this industrial revolution, which transformed the world beyond all recognition and lifted millions of people out of poverty and has given us our modern way of life. But now, there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity for us to go forward into the world and actually promote the second and third green revolution, rather. And actually, we can make this work for us in many ways, not just for the environment itself. Councillor um, Durkin raised many um, excellent examples, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with them. And Councillor Mason mentioned about the air quality. Um, I agree as well. The upside of actually acting upon this will actually be to improve the air quality and to minimise the impact on the young, the, uh, the infirm and the elderly who are suffering because of poor air quality caused by um, internal combustion engine and other forms of pollutants like that. Councillor um, Durkin touched upon the fact, he gave that very good example of going out for a, for a takeaway. And, and I think that's where the leadership will come from, from this council, when we say we're going to develop an action plan which focuses on that wider impact because sometimes there's just an overwhelming sense of futility that people have in their day to day. Well, I, I want to, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I've just been handled all this stuff and I don't know what to do with it. I can't put it in this bin, I can't put it in that bin, but I've been given it. I still want the kebab, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I'm sure it was, you know. So, hopefully, if we can develop a robust enough plan as a council, the kinds of things, the leadership um, that this council can hopefully provide on this issue will remove that sense of futility and then the detractors and naysayers will sound just as uh, just as out of touch as the, the village idiot did many many hundreds of years ago and they'll be uh, sort of thrown to the fringes of our society and so uh, I suppose what gives me great hope is that just listening here today and yes it's right I'm a teacher along with the other two people that uh, have been mentioned and uh, it gives me great there's no shortage of ideas, no shortage of solutions to this problem. Uh, and, and in that, uh, renews my, my faith in um, the ingenuity of man to get out of a tight spot. And it was man in the general sense, I include women in that as well, to get out of a tight spot. And I think we can get out of a tight spot if we put our minds to it and we actually start talking about the solutions to the problem rather than worrying about the futility of the, of the challenge that faces us. So, um, we now have a very long list of commitments that we will deliver as Harlow's part of addressing this climate emergency. One of them was that I said in my speech I would use what influence I have 
to encourage businesses and um, other councils to um, accept that this emergency exists and do what they can. And I'm actually going to start that job now and use what influence I have with councillors' offices. But yeah. I know you meet regularly, um, Councillor Johnson, with our MP, and you'll be aware that um, your government recently, the Conservative government recently, increased the cost of photovoltaic cells by 20% um, through the imposition of the VAT. Um, perhaps you would, in your next meeting, talk to him about how that tax is probably regressive when it comes to delivering um, a reduction in climate change. Because it's all very well. And I want to pick up on one point that you made. I thoroughly agree with that the burden mustn't fall on the shoulders of the poor. So many of these new technologies are actually now cheaper than the old technology. An electric vehicle if it is more expensive to buy, but it's so much cheaper to um, fill up with electricity that over the life and the maintenance costs are so much cheaper, it's so much simpler. But over the lifetime of a vehicle, they're now cheaper than diesel or petrol engines. We just need to get the infrastructure in place to encourage people to use them. But only if the electricity is produced in a sustainable fashion. And that's why we need um, the government too to listen to the pleas from residents and from individuals and from councils and look at sparking a revolution in a way that we generate our electricity. Thank you.